Good afternoon. Um, this is Ann DeSaro from uh, the New York State Coalition for the Aging. Welcome you to our third in our series of fall webinars for professional development. Um, these, this series has been brought to you to share information and resources on improving aging programs. And today we're uh, very pleased to present to you time management um, brought to you by Frank Wartz, uh, who's a consultant for Professional Care Management Institute. Um, these webinars are, um, as I said, brought to you by the New York State Coalition for the Aging, which is an organization statewide in New York State that has as members uh, providers of services to older people, and uh, in collaboration with the New York State Association of Area Agencies on Aging. And it's been funded by a grant from the New York State Office for the Aging. Um, we will have one more uh, of these uh, webinars um, on Monday, and we'll tell you more about that at the end of our presentation. It's important for you to know that this um, webinar will be recorded, and that the slides, the PowerPoint slides that you'll be seeing today, uh, both the re recording and the PowerPoint uh, slides are available on the New York State Association of Area Agencies website, which is www.agingnewyork. Dot org. And at this time, the uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation is on that website if, if you would uh, need to get it at, at this point. And the recording should be up there uh, either by the end of the day or sometime tomorrow. Um, let me give you just a little bit of information about what we're going to try to undertake today, just on kind of a general note. Um, I don't know that we were thinking so much about the fact that the stress management, which Frank did earlier for us, and time management would be not only relevant to us professionally working in the aging, but that we're presenting these in December when we need both stress management and time management to make it all the way to the end of the month. Very good planning on our part. Um, but actually, Frank's going to help us as an aging network um, look at all the demands that are on our time and trying to effectively manage our time um, as it becomes a priority of growing importance with lots of different things that we have to do. And this session is designed to address the realities of how people currently use their time and the most common mistakes we make in managing our time and perhaps new ways to think about time and how it is used. Our presenter is from Professional Care Management Institute, which is a a firm in Pennsylvania that, that deals only with um, training and, and support of uh, organizations in the human service field uh, with a particular focus on aging. So we're very fortunate to have their expertise um, for this series of webinars this year. And Frank was the founding member of uh, PCMI and has over 45 years of experience in the aging, health, and social service fields. He provides consultation and training on case management, aging-related issues, mental health, housing, quality assurance, management, and technology on the regional and national level. He is presently an assistant professor at Lincoln University in the Masters of Human Service program. Um, we're very fortunate uh, to have Frank with us. And just one more uh, administrative note, we are going to have an opportunity for questions uh, twice during this presentation. Once about halfway through, we'll pause and take any questions that people have. And there's a box in the, uh, there's this portion of the box on the right side of your screen that is uh, for questions. And uh, we would like you to think of questions as Frank makes his presentation and write them in there. I will be able to see those and ask him those questions both at the middle of the presentation, as I said, and at the end. So with that, I will turn this over to Frank, and we're so happy to have you with us and look forward to your presentation today. Well, thank you, Ann. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you and your organization for giving us the opportunity to present PCMI's Time Management Program. Notice it's titled Getting Started or Revisiting. I'm sure that for many of us, if not most of us who are working in aging, we probably have spent some time thinking about organizing our time better or uh, probably trying to figure out what's going wrong or what's going right 
with the way we manage our time. So I'd like to point out and reiterate what you said, and that is that about halfway through the presentation, uh, we'll entertain questions, and then again, I'll do the same thing at the end of the presentation. So I would ask our participants to send you their questions as they occur to them. Uh, the goals for today are fairly straightforward. Uh, I'll discuss the typical issues we see when PCMI works with people on their time management skills. And I'll explore how time really gets used. But I must warn us all that for some people, there's a tremendous level of desire, denial about how time really gets used. I'll also identify some of the typical mistakes people make and things to consider in correcting them around time management. And finally, I'll end by giving some specific suggestions and strategies for better time management. Uh, please be aware that since we're not meeting face to face, it's hard to personalize today's content. As you know, time management is a very personal thing. And as they say, one size certainly does not fit all. So with that in mind, take what you think is useful for you and your situation and leave those things that don't seem to fit behind. Before moving on, I'd like to offer the following three quotes as important concepts in dealing with time. I think Henry David Thoreau got it right. It's just not about being busy. Rather, it is how we are busy. What it is that is taking our time and keeping us busy. That's a good lead into Stephen Covey's quote, effective time management is not about how we spend time, but rather how we invest it towards reaching goals. And finally, this takes us to Lee Iacocca's quote, you really don't have to have goal, you really do have to have goals in order to know where and how your time can best be invested. I'll talk more about these ideas later in the presentation. For now, let's move on one of the inescapable realities of time management. The data on the slide is a part of ongoing research by AOL and their Find a Job site. While the specific numbers may not apply to your particular organization or people, it does raise concerns that there is likely time not being used well. Notice that the average public sector worker wastes two plus hours per day. How is time wasted? Now we have to keep in mind that different studies show the ranking of these items as listed on the slide in slightly different terms. However, they are pretty consistent in that these are the typical kind of time wasters that are likely to exist in your workplace too. Perhaps one of the more interesting set of figures show that what people in human resources publicly assume is wasted is lower than what the, they privately suspect is being wasted. And in addition, the amount of time actually admitted by the employees as being wasted is even larger. So I think an honest assessment would suggest that when people say they don't have enough time, it is likely not completely true. Are there going to be exceptions to this? Yes, of course there will be. 
yet the data would suggest that people have time that can be more productive if it is not being wasted doing other things. We only have so much time. We can't reduce it. We can't manufacture it. What we have is 24 hours, 1,440 minutes, or 86,400 seconds each day. That's it. There is not more, and there's not less. Given this reality, it is what we do with the finite amount of time each day that matters. So next, I want to move on to the typical issues we hear when working with people on time management. There are four things we hear pretty consistently. There's too much to do and not enough time. I think this is the feeling of being overwhelmed. It typically occurs when someone knows there are items, issues, challenges, or tasks that they are not going to get done. I have a friend whose wife is like this. It doesn't matter how much she accomplishes every day, and she gets a lot of things accomplished. It never seems to be enough. She always has a sense of, I didn't get enough done today. So until she shifts the way she thinks about time, this is not likely to change for her. One of the things she struggles with is the reality that not everything that she believes has to be done has the same level of importance. She tends to make everything on her to-do list equal in importance. And as we will see later, this almost is never true. Others are wasting my time. We tend to hear this when people have some level of annoyance, frustration, or even resentment that others are distracting them from work that they want to be doing. Or in some cases, work that they know they have to complete, even if it's a task that they're not especially eager to accomplish. A large part of what we found in these situations is that people forget the significance of it being their time. That is, they are correct in saying my time, but they've forgotten the importance of or don't know how to take active ownership of their time. Try as others might, it is also impossible to waste someone's time if they don't let you. The key is learning how to keep people from taking your time. This is an area I'll be addressing in more detail later. I can't get anything done. We've come to understand that when we hear this, what we're hearing is a form of crooked thinking. It is almost never true that the person can't get anything done. Rather, we find that one of two things is happening. One, the person has set unrealistic expectations about what he or she can accomplish in a given time frame. Then, when they don't reach these lofty goals, they feel completely defeated. Two, the person has realistic goals, but allows distractions, interruptions, or less important things to interfere with complete, completing what he or she sets out to do. What is really unfortunate about this is that many people come to see themselves as ineffective and come to believe the messages they are giving themselves. The truth is, however, that if you can't get anything done, you wouldn't even have been able to sign up for this webinar today. They keep adding more and more things to do. 
people have a sense that it doesn't matter how efficient they are, there will continue to be more demands, and they're right. When was the last time you were asked to do less? It doesn't happen often, if ever. Imagine someone at work saying, we need you to slow down. Don't do too much. Take it easy. Realistically, we are in a world where we are asked to do more, not less. PCMI uses an exercise to illustrate this. In a training, we recruit a volunteer for a demonstration. We hand the volunteer a piece of masking tape and ask them to place it on the wall as high as they can. Typically, the person goes to the wall, stretches, and puts the tape several free feet above their head. Then we hand them a second piece of tape saying, that was a great job, but this piece needs to be higher. Without fail, they're able to do this. Most simply jump, placing the tape higher than the first piece. Then we say, that was another great job. You did get it higher. But here's the third piece, and I need this even higher. Some laugh and take the challenge on with determination. Others get frustrated or stuck and need encouragement. When the person is frustrated or struck, we say, you don't need to do this alone. We then turn to the rest of the class and ask, who has an idea that will help? Almost always, someone says, get a chair to stand on. When the chair is in place, we stand next to the person, offering support so they don't fall. And guess what? The tape is placed even higher. We thank the person and debrief saying, most of us don't really know the limits of our capability. We make good faith efforts, just like we saw with the first attempt, and, more, and when more is needed, we rise to the occasion. Everyone in this class knows that the tape can be put even higher than the third attempt. We know it's possible. People will continue to ask us to do more and we'll be challenged to find ways to be successful. But let's be clear, most of us have not reached our potential in terms of what is possible. Next, I'd like to turn to typical time management mistakes. And I'll, try, I'll talk about how three mistakes, how these mistakes, I'm sorry, can be corrected. As we go through these, try to determine if this is a mistake you're prone to making and what you might do differently to correct it. A to-do list is an absolute necessity if one wants to effectively manage his or her time. Yet the ability to create a to-do list has in many ways never been easier. For example, Microsoft's popular program Office in its Outlook program has one built right in. I think what also complicates this is that many people haven't learned to use a to-do list properly. In fact, a recent LinkedIn survey of 6,000 professionals found that only about 11% of the professionals felt that they were using their to-do list correctly. Despite the general misuse of the to-do list, its value should not be underestimated. Here are six advantages to using one. Creates the to-do list creates a focus on what needs to be done. A to-do list pro provides the possibility of looking at the total number of tasks and their context so that we can assign appropriate priorities. A to-do list lets us identify patterns that are similar 
so we can organize things to get things through in a more efficient and a quicker way. Uh, to do this lets us quickly get reoriented when we're interrupted. It also reduces the worries that we all have about forgetting to do a task. And finally, for some of us, it creates a sense of accomplishment when the items are checked off when they're completed. Here are the recommendations we make concerning the use of a to-do list. Only items that you plan to actually get done on a, any given day should be listed. All too often people use their to-do list as a kind of storage place for things that need to be done but not today. For example, if I know that I have to check on a meeting next month but no, don't need to do it today, I shouldn't put it on my to-do list. Rather, we suggest keeping a note list. This list should include all the things you need to remember but don't yet need to schedule for completion. By the way, this technique is often suggested for people with attention deficit disorder. It allows you to not lose important ideas or thoughts, and it provides a way to keep track of upcoming tasks without making your daily to-do list a cluttered mess. How you create and keep your notes list is a matter of personal preference. Some people carry a small notebook with them at all times. Others carry a small tape recorder. And with the sophistication of today's smartphones, you can even send yourself an email or a text message. With some, you can even use the phone as a voice recorder or use their app, which is a daily organizer. The point is that your to-do list should only contain things you intend to accomplish that day. In the example on the slide, you see a to-do to list and a notes list. The difference is that the to-do list only lists items that the person intends to complete today. The notes list is a place to keep a running list of all future tasks. The next thing we suggest is that your to-do list should be the first thing you do every day or the last thing you do at the end of the workday. If you wait longer, you run the risk of working on things that don't really need to be accomplished today and not get focused on those things that do need to be accomplished today. We suggest you create your daily to-do list by first reviewing yesterday's list to see if there are any leftover items that you need to complete. If so, you should go they, if so, they should go on today's list. Next, you should review your notes list and determine which items on this list need to be accomplished today. Then these should be added to today's to-do list. We also suggest that you break larger tasks into smaller ones. If you remember in the earlier list, one task was the monthly progress report. Well, it might be that you can't complete the entire progress report in one setting. You can, however, make your to-do list manageable by breaking it down. 
For example, today's item on the to-do list might simply be gather documents needed for the progress report. Then block out time in a calendar for writing the first draft. We also suggest that you group similar tasks. For example, if you have three phone calls to make, consider listing them together and making them within the same block of time. Of course, this may not work when you have specific times pre-scheduled for you to call. But when possible, it saves time to get all your calls out of the way at once. One of the biggest mistakes is not prioritizing your to-do list. One way we offer for prior prioritizing your work list is by understanding the difference between urgent and important. The reality is that some things are important but not urgent, and others are urgent but not important. So if you look at quadrants one and three, you begin to get a sense of the meaning between and difference between important and not important. So let's look at this chart in more detail. You'll notice that in quadrant four are neither urgent nor important. These type items should be avoided, or if they can't be avoided, they should be on the bottom of your to-do list. If something can't get done, it should ideally be from this quadrant. Next, let's look at quadrant one. These items are both urgent and important. These are things we must do. They should be at the top of our to-do list. Next, look at quadrants two and three. These are the quadrants where there must be some type of a balancing act. There will be some things that are urgent over which we have little control. That is, we may not think they are important, but someone else does. So we must attend to them. In quadrant two, we see those things that are important but not urgent. Yet, the items in this quadrant are the ones that typically get completely ignored. That is not, in our opinion, a very wise move. Rather, these items are the key to making sure that items in the fourth quadrant don't become the bulk of our day. So these items must be balanced with those from the third quadrant. Okay, so here we have an example of a to-do list that has been built balancing important with urgent. You'll note that the bottom two items really don't need to get done. That is, they are neither urgent or all that important. You'll also note that the top two items are important and may be urgent, depending on the particular situation. Finally, you'll see two items in the middle from quadrants three and four. This to-do list properly lays out what should be done and in what order, but we're missing one important element here, and that is the importance of setting goals. Another big mistake that people make in time management is not knowing where to invest their time. It's hard, if not impossible, 
to set realistic priorities if you don't have personal goals set. It is also important to recognize that most of us have a work life and a non-work life. There is some overlap, but generally most people are able to make the distinction between the two. For the purpose of setting personal goals, they should be set for each area, and most of them will be different. Fundamental to any effort to manage time better in your work life is a recognition that you have to clearly define goals for what you want to accomplish. Some find it useful to think in terms of different time frames for setting goals. For example, some ask, what are my long-term career goals? What are the steps I need to take to get there? Or what must I do to be successful now? By doing this, you have started to lay out a map of long-term, mid-range, and short-term goals. Long-term goals don't change often. Mid-term goals can change depending on circumstances. But short-term goals may change on a monthly, weekly, or even daily basis. To increase your chance of success, you need to have all three perspectives of goals defined. At this point, let us break for some questions and see if I can answer concerns that might have been generated thus far. Uh, thank you, Frank. Um, if you have, I do not have any questions written um, in, but this, if you have a question and you just haven't gotten to typing it in, remember it's on your screen on the right. You can type it in and I will convey that to Frank. Um, I, I had one uh, note that I wrote down here and maybe we can uh, look at that. If, if it's possible for you to do it, you went back to, uh, you had a slide that said what people are doing at work that is not work related, kind of the areas where they're uh, getting caught in that. Um, this there. one? Yeah. Um, you're, uh, can you kind of look at this and relate that to uh, some of the things you were talking about, the balance between um, you know, personal and work, some of the things uh, need to be done during uh, working hours, making appointments with uh, people, office, uh, you know, maybe medical appointments or other personal appointments, so that has to be done while you're at work. But can you just kind of talk about how we see here that uh, a great deal of this time has to do with, with personal um, things that are the... Um, how time is uh, wasted in the workplace and how you balance a little bit unless you're going to do that in the second half. That was just something that occurred to me in looking at that slide. Well, we will be doing some of that in the second half, but I will uh, say that uh, this is probably where we have to take a close look at where the personal and the work life overlap. And I think that there, everyone would agree that there are some things that take place in our personal life that have to be uh, dealt with in our work life. So we're not saying here that uh, personal life cannot be taken care of in the work life. We're saying that we have to kind of watch that. We're going to be talking a lot about socializing with co-workers co-work, uh, co-workers. Um, in, in the second part, and we're going to be talking about calls and email, um, and most importantly, we're going to be talking about um, uh, this notion of arriving late, arriving early, but we're going to address it more from the perspective of why. Typically, what we see is that people arrive early, leave or arrive 
early, late, and leave early, it probably has more to do with attitudes that are taking place about around the job. Okay. So we will be addressing many of these in the second half. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't have any other questions, so let's get uh, back um, to your presentation. <laughs> okay, thank you thank very you. much. Right. You're welcome. Now I'd like to change the focus a little bit and talk about the notion of managing distractions and what it means if we fail to manage distractions. Of course, we all know that the major problem with distractions is that they interrupt our workflow. Each interruption requires that we re-engage with our work. If we want to gain control over effective use of our time, we really have to minimize distractions and interruptions. Let's look at some of the more common distractions. There was a study done by researchers at the University of California at Irvine which monitored interruptions among office workers. And they found that workers took an average of 25 minutes to recover from interruptions such as phone calls or answering email before they returned to their original task. And that, to me, sounds significant. In today's world, in our electronic environment, email is one of the major distractions that we have to manage. If you're someone who was typical of those in the trainings that we provide in Pennsylvania, you'll check email too many times during the day. Most emails are not emergencies. Unless it is a specific job requirement, there really is no reason to check your email more than two or three times during the workday. Here's how you can get your email under control. One, follow a schedule or routine for checking email, perhaps at the start of the day, once during midday, and again towards the end of the day. No matter how tempted you are, stick with your schedule. You'll shorten the amount of wasted time in your day. The second thing is you can reduce the temptation to check email. Many people aren't aware that you can set most email programs so that you don't receive an alert every time an email shows up. On the next two slides, I'd like to show you how to do this using Microsoft Office and its Outlook program. In Microsoft Outlook, if you check on Tools and then Options, at the bottom of the pull-down list, then check on Email Options, then check on Advanced Options. This will open the dialog box on the next slide. Once you open the Advanced Options tab, this will open a dialog box where you can control how email notices are handled. To avoid the distraction of having email notices pop up and interrupt your workflow, you'll want to uncheck all the items in this section. You can do a similar thing with your smartphones also set them up so that you don't get an alarm with each coming with each incoming email since you're checking three times a day no one will have to wait too long before you see their message 
phone calls can be difficult for many people to manage. You may find that you're required to be on call. When this is the case, you really have little choice but to answer the phone when it rings. If possible, however, here are a few suggestions you might want to consider. Allow your voicemail to do its job. Let the person leave a message. Of course, we recommend that you do the same thing with voicemail as with email. Check it no more than three times per day. If you are using a phone with caller ID, we still encourage you to let your voicemail do its job. However, if that's too hard, take a quick peek at who is calling and then decide if the call is likely to be one you really need to take right now. The other thing you can do with your smartphone is to turn the alarm or the phone volume off when you don't want to be disturbed. For instance, when I'm teaching, I turn my cell phone off once I start in the morning and review the calls that were received at noon. For the afternoon, I turn the phone off and then I turn it back on to see what calls have to be returned around 6 o'clock. For all the students in my classes, I give them this schedule so that it's easier for them and for me to manage the time. Now please understand that we understand that for older people, calling in to agencies, the answering service might be something that they find confusing or off-putting. So we have to use discretion when we talk about managing calls coming in to an agency. In this regard, one of the things that we find is that people working in organizations sometimes use the bartering system to set up a phone answering protocol that permits individuals to take time needed to finish projects and not feel that they're neglecting their clients who need to call in. So one person who needs to focus without interruption will ask a coworker to screen his or her calls for a predetermined period of time. Then when that person finishes with the uninterrupted time, they switch roles so that the other individual can get work done in an interrupted, in a non-interrupted way. Last but not least is the intruder. These are the people who physically show up at your workspace and expect your full attention. And if you remember in our earlier list, over 26% of the time wasted is on socializing. The trick with intruders is to teach them not to interrupt you during certain times. It is important that you claim your time for the work you need to do to reach your goals. And if you don't teach an intruder that there are times when you can't be interrupted, you'll find they keep coming back. The most successful technique we've seen for doing this is deciding on the signal you'll use 
to let people know that you need to focus and don't want to be interrupted. If you have a door you can close, by all means do close it. But also consider putting a sign on the door telling people when you'll be available, like the one on the sign, slide. This approach requires more teaching than the first. You might find that you must patiently and politely tell people about the sign and how important it is that they honor it. For instance, some people leave a sign on their desk and go to a quiet area in the agency to complete work that needs to be done with an interrupted piece of time. When people come and interrupt you in that private space, they need to be educated in both what your sign means and that you are serious about needing the time to complete your work. The myth of multitasking. In 2005, the BBC reported on a research study funded by Eulard Packard and conducted by the Institute of Psychiatry at the University of London that found workers distracted by email and phone calls suffer a fall in IQ more than twice that found in marijuana smokers. Now, to learn more about this, I recommend Christine Rosen's article, The Myth of Multitasking, in the Spring 208 Journal of the New Atlantic. You can download the article in a PDF format with the link that's on this slide. In 2006, a study by William M. Mercer Incorporated a global human resource consultant firm, identified these coal facts. Most people can keep their jobs working at only 20% to 30% of capacity. Several workplace studies show that at least 25% of workers said that they were capable of doing 50% more work. And on average, they estimated they could do 26% more work. Now, I offer these hard facts as a reminder that most people can do more than they currently think or say they can. The particular area I'm going to focus on now is based on our experience of doing training in hundreds of agencies and consulting with dozens of organizations. We found that worker attitude is number one of the biggest contributor to the wasting of time. The Monday morning blues. You've likely heard this kind of attitude. It shows up with comments such as, oh, it's Monday again, or the weekend sure went fast and now we're back here again, said with a level of disdain that is unmistakable. Or, over the hump, it's Wednesday, thank God it's Friday. The implication of all these is that work is not desirable or something one has to find a better way to be of find a better way to bear. And our experience has been that these kinds of comments are actually a part of the work culture in many places. We need to shift the tone. Since we live in a culture where negative attitudes are work, about work are the norm. These attitudes show up on morning radio shows in informal greetings with others in much the same way that asking about the weather occurs. It simply becomes an accepted part 
of social interaction. Our experience, however, has been that negative talk and attitudes contribute a great deal to wasting time. There are really two parts to this. One is that such an attitude tends to deplete the energy people need to take on the challenges of busy work lives. It's hard to be motivated to do something that is, that is seen as an undesirable sure. The second part of this is related to the actual amount of time people spend dealing with things in a negative way. Another example of what we've come to call negative or trash talk can be seen when people spend time talking and complaining about things over which they have no control. For example, recently there have been changes in the way that services are being delivered in the Area Agencies on Aging System in Pennsylvania. In many of the agencies where we provide training, you can hear comments like, those bureaucrats at the state have no idea what, we're do what they're doing. That simple comment by one individual can lead to a five-minute conversation about the perceived inadequacies of others. So now you've got people with lower levels of energy and perhaps less motivation who have just wasted five minutes they cannot get back. So as simple as it sounds, one of the things you can do is eliminate your participation in these kinds of conversations. They are huge, huge, huge time wasters. Let's look at some final suggestions. One of the things we suggest for people who have a real challenge managing their time is a two-day activity where they actually keep track of what they are doing. You do this by stopping whatever it is you're doing every half hour and write down what you did in the half hour. While it is time consuming, after two days of this, you get a very clear picture of where and how you use your time. Now remember in the beginning we said that there is quite a bit of denial in terms of how time is used and is not used. This procedure permits us to get a realistic reading of how we use or do not use our time. The second suggestion we would make is that email can be a time killer. Reading messages more than once or having to scroll through long lists of messages to find the one you want are time killers. Our suggestion is read it once, then act on it, file it, or delete it. Another final suggestion that we offer is don't be afraid to say no. Saying no is difficult for some of us. However, when time is limited, it is an important skill to have. Learn to politely say no or decline to do something without feeling guilty. Now for most of us, this is very important since many of us take on roles that are beyond our job description or that are viewed as enhancements to our job description. And people will come to us 
and ask us to help them with something that everyone knows we're good at. Many times this impinges on the work we have to do to keep our own caseloads or workload in order. One of the skills that we all have to develop is the ability to nicely say no and maybe in some cases not say no but to reschedule. Research shows that most people work better when they take short breaks to recharge themselves. So organize your breaks. Some people suggest even put them on your schedule like you would do anything else that's important to the efficiency and effectiveness of your day. Another suggestion we would offer is that in our experience too many meetings are held when a simple memo or email would have sufficed. Save meetings for those times when you need interaction between people for a decision to be made. If it's just information sharing, don't take valuable time by making people come to a meeting. Simply add something to the email or memo that provides them the opportunity of providing feedback if needed. Another idea related to meetings is that of avoiding meetings where no clear agenda is set. Meetings without clear agendas are de destined to be longer and wander more than meetings with agendas. I guess it's important for all of us to learn to ask when invited to a meeting what the agenda is and avoid those meetings where there is no clear agenda. At least by asking what the agenda is, we're creating a gentle reminder that all meetings should have agendas. The other thing we suggest is you might not have to do everything yourself. If there are support people or others who can do things for you as well or better than you, learn to use them. Now again, we have to be careful not to overburden people by placing tasks on them as we discussed above. Finally, we think it's appropriate to block out time for some tasks by placing them like you would on your calendar as a meeting or other event. This can help in two ways. First, in offices where people can see on one another's calendars, it can reduce people scheduling things for you. And second, it helps focus your attention on what specific tasks need to be accomplished at any given time. Now let's take a quick review. The first thing we identified in this session is that we only have 24 hours a day. Yet most of us, if not all of us, waste valuable time. Second, we need to recognize that we're not likely to be asked to do less. We are always going to be asked to do more. The third thing that we covered is that we honestly need to assess where and how we use our time 
and find out if, in fact, we do waste time. So we need to identify if we, in fact, are denying our waste of time. Fourth, we need to avoid crooked thinking. That is, that we can't get anything done. And that all things are similar and important. Again, we need to use a to-do list, but the to-do list has to be used correctly. We need to separate the urgent and the important. Then we need to set goals to help us prioritize our to-do list. The goals need to be long-term, medium, and short-term. Probably the biggest issue we face is we need to eliminate as many distractions as possible. We focused on email, phones, and people intruding, asking for advice or for conversation. We also should avoid multitasking. It seems to be a myth. We heard the example from the University of London. We're now getting examples all the time about people who use cell phones or, or eat while they're driving also have a much higher ratio or number of accidents. So multitasking is a myth. We need to focus and organize the activities that we need to complete. And finally, we need to avoid negative or trash talk. If we get a positive attitude on the workplace and we try to make the atmosphere or the culture in our agency more positive, we're probably going to be reducing the amount of time that is wasted in our agency. At this point, I'm going to end the presentation and ask if there are any questions that I could entertain in the remaining time in this session. Hi, uh, th Frank, thank you so much. Um, on our screens, the last slide that we have been able to, to see is the last final uh, suggestion slide that you had. Oh, it's and not I, moving. That's... Um, oh, it didn't move. Um, the last, so your summary slides, uh, we didn't see. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, it's a quick review. So for those of you who are on, there are those slides if you wanted, after the final suggestions, the next slides that he spoke to. If you just kind of run through those um, slowly, people can take a look at those maybe. Sure. And we did have a question. Well, now I'm, we're, uh, go, keep going. So we, you saw this slide, the negative yes. or trash talk? Okay. And then we the saw. The other ones didn't come up? The final suggestions we saw, that slide, okay. and the next slide, and the next slide, and then that we didn't see. Oh, okay. And anything after that. Okay, so there's another slide after this one. All right, so um, while, you're, while people have a chance to look at that and the next one, thank you, we mm -hmm. have a question that said, who's the author of the negative time wasters cold hard facts? Where, well, I guess the question is, Maybe where's the source of that data? Okay. That's on the slide, I believe. Um, it's, it's on the slide. I just have to page through to uh, find, find it. it. Yeah, well, just while sure. you're doing that, uh, a, a mm -hmm. reminder that um, to everyone on the phone that this entire um, 
PowerPoint so that you can have copies of these slides yourself is at www.agingnewyork.org and that's there currently so um, you could go there and, and find the entire um, book of slides that uh, Frank has led us through today. Right. Uh, did you find the... I'm still flipping through here. And if any of the rest of you have any questions, um, I, you can put it in the questions box. Um, I think these are important. Uh, Actually, go ahead. The, uh, the slide on the cold hard facts comes from a study by the William M. Mercer Incorporated. Uh, it's a global human resource consulting firm that has done research. And uh, it's, the study was done in 2006. Okay. You could probably Google that and uh, you would get this study. I don't have any other questions I, that have come through and, and I think this has been really very interesting uh, to everybody on the phone personally and professionally. The last slide we have that you can see up now is the way to uh, be able to send Frank additional questions at the email um, that is there um, with, the, with the title so that he knows um, what session you were talking about since he's done two for us. Um, and we want to thank, I would like to thank Frank very much for having done both the stress management and the time management with us in, in this uh, series and, and really appreciate all the um, thought-provoking information and comments that you brought to us. It's been very helpful. Thank you. I now, I now know that I have to do a little better job putting my to-do list since I'm inclined to put the kitchen sink on there. So <laughs> <laughs> I, thank, I thank you very much for all of this help. I also want to thank uh, Karen Thornton at the New York State Association of Area Agencies on Aging. She's our the technical person that helps make all of this happen, and uh, we couldn't do it without her assistance. Um, now I would ask all the attendees to stay on the phone call for just a few minutes after the call ends because there will be a survey that pops up and your feedback to us is very important uh, and we would like uh, to have your input so please just stay connected to this website and fill out the survey. We have one more of our um, series uh, this fall and that is on Monday and it's not too late to sign up for it. It's person-centered planning. We're, um, it will be brought to us by Brad Levan and it's really talking about how we uh, in the aging network uh, go through an assessment of looking at an individual. What what kind of approach are we taking? And it's a very interesting discussion and concept that uh, Brad will be talking to us about on Monday. It's from 1 to 2.30 as has been the rest of them. And you can go and register again at www.agingnewyork.org and you will get a, uh, a link to be able to get into the webinar on Monday afternoon. So if you haven't registered, it's not too late and we would love to have you join us. Thank you very much, um, and I wish you all a happy holidays, and thank you, Frank, very much for your um, good information today. And 